<laughs> everybody, Gary's uh, I, learning, I, I, learning I, some numbers. Oh, I, 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 don't, I don't play football. I'm sorry. You don't play football? Well, except on Thanksgiving. My family, they think you have the, to play football they think well enough the to know metaphors and stuff. Oh, right. Metaphors. Right? Because a lot of people use football metaphors or baseball metaphors, and if you don't understand the game, you don't get the meta fives. Right. Because the metaphors are easy. The meta fives are when, when it gets complicated. Right. Yes. Right. Well, this is Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades. I'm Matt Connerton, and this is, of course, the Honorable Gary S. Hopper. This is me. This is you. I had I had that confirmed this afternoon, so I Finally. know. Finally. Yeah, I know. I was I've getting, been concerned. I was confused. Yeah. Easily confused. So, so our guest is Jim Adams. Jim Adams is running for executive council. And, gosh, what a, an awesome would be to get you in there instead of the gentleman who's currently in there. That would be my hope as well. Oh. Which gentleman are you referring to? Can we not speak his name? Yes. Oh, you can. <laughs> I, I try not to because I didn't want. But uh, 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 this is now held by uh, a Democrat. It's a considered a Republican seat held by a Democrat. Right. Uh, Mr. Pappas is a wonderful fellow, but uh, he does good. He does great food over at his oh, restaurant. Oh, he sure does. And but at the same time, he uh, is a no matter what, he is a straight vote. Right down the line for the liberal doesn't progressive. Does not movement. even hesitate. Nope. He doesn't even come close to thinking about the vote. Right. Just checks it off. Yeah, that's really bad. But anyway, I put on Facebook proof positive. I don't know. Do you see my proof positive? No. Proof positive that we I have um, kangaroos in my property. Oh, oh, I did see. I'm sorry. I did see that. Yes. Right. Here's the proof. A, we all know that female kangaroos hold the babies in their pouches, mm -hmm. right? So, because there are no baby kangaroos running around my yard, I know there's female kangaroos actually keeping an eye on them. Ah, uh, that's that. Could I, be. You that can't could. argue with that. Really. Well, I'm, I would not begin to. <laughs> now, did you move to Australia? No, oh. no, I did not. Nope. Nope. <laughs> or did you and you're hiding it from the voters because you know if they know that you don't really live in where anymore, they won't vote for you. Well, where could be in Australia. There could be a where in Australia. There very well may be. Yeah, I don't think so, but it could be. Mm -hmm. Anyway. You haven't heard that before, have you? No, I don't think I have. No. I have to be quite honest. I don't think I've heard that. That's, that's a great and the And the little pouch, that's where they put the Joey. That's the right, little one exactly. is the Joey. Exactly, the little Joey, yep. So anyway, <laughs> now that we've settled that, <laughs> I was up there both times when the ex oh, first of all, let's get get down to basics. Explain to the voters what the executive council is, because people don't even know. I think they see your signs, and they probably see uh, Pappas' signs, and they don't even know what that really is. Well, it's very interesting. New Hampshire is one of the only states in the union that has the weakest governor. That governor cannot appoint anyone. It cannot uh, appoint, whether they be judges or commissioners, or cannot sign any large contracts, can do none of that without three of the five counselors saying, I approve. And uh, it's, I think, a prime example right now is the, the train wreck disaster of the uh, State Liquor Commission and their new warehouse and the lawsuits that have developed from that. And, and it's very interesting because I've done a lot of homework on this. Uh, back in 2009, then Senator Maggie Hassan brought forward legislation to take the State Liquor Commission out from under the direct uh, responsibility of the Executive Council. Okay. And what they did was they said because they have to make rapid decisions on the run, yeah. we'll just let them do this themselves. They what, was Mike Milligan the commissioner at that I, time. I don't or? know who the commission. There were three commissioners at that time, if I remember correctly. Oh, okay. That was for they were down to one. So there's uh, so there's five executive councilmen and three ex liquor commissioners. And at that about time, they were right. Okay. But but the the bottom line is is that they were allowed to be operate like a business without the supervision of the executive council, and they put this contract out for bid. 
Um, then they uh, they are alleged allegedly they have then they contacted during this process a couple of the out of state bidders to say well if you come up a little bit or go down a little bit you might be the winner mm -hmm. and from wow. the history that I have we used to where I came from five hundred million dollar contracts if I were to have picked the phone up and done that I would be making little rocks out of big rocks I mean right. you, you, you go to jail for that stuff right. and I'm not I, I'm not saying that anyone's done anything illegal but it's really doesn't look like it's according to Hoyle and now to this point because of the way they skunked up the bidding process and then the uh, eventual award right now that you and I the taxpayers of New Hampshire have paid 3.6 million dollars in legal fees and a uh, a settlement with the original holder, the fellow from Nashua that held the old contract, they gave him $2.5 million. And another example of what the Executive Council does, you, any personal contract under $10,000 does not have to come before the Council. Anything over, it must. The Attorney General's Office hired an attorney to help the Attorney General's Office over, supervise and oversee the um, I guess the RFP and all the subsequent paperwork of that bid for the new warehouse. He submitted his, f two months in, he submitted his invoice for $40,000. That immediately should have come right. before the, well right now, and I hear that the meter is still ticking, it's $1.1 million that was never approved by the Executive Council. So the Attorney General's office approved an attorney to to represent who again? To represent or to help the State Liquor Commission in their R RFP process and the bidding for this warehouse because it was now such why a big do, thing. Why, I, I hear that all the time in Concord where the Attorney General's hired other attorneys to do things. <laughs> I thought they were all attorneys. So did I and the best part of it, and you'll appreciate this Gary, the f five Assistant Attorney Generals sat at the trial and this fellow that the had the contract he sat with them never said a word in the, the entire proceedings really and he was getting paid for that and right now as i said that the the are last they, are these like friends of friends that are getting the, these the, well the fellow used to be he used to work for the attorney general's office and now he's in his private practice oh uh, i don't like, know if, yeah. good old-fashioned crony capitalism but that in a nutshell is what it's all about mm -hmm. with our uh, executive council they are supposed to pre prevent things like that and they would have had they had the oversight mm -hmm. but because of that so you so in this particular case in all fairness you can't really pin this on Pappas because oh no 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 okay so yeah. you're not saying anything bad no. about him no because the the legislature and the uh, now and and the previous governor had already given the governor the are uh, the uh, Liquor Commission actual full authority. Right, but the legislature changed that era in 2013, and they are now back under the guise of the uh, or the the supervision of the uh, executive council. Executive council. Has so thing, have things gotten better since? Well, this thing is still uh, going right, down the road, and and I'm not. I would say that uh, it hasn't gotten better with this attorney general's contract. Why have? And now, if I'm an executive counselor, I'm going to say. We've got an outside attorney who's been running the, the meter to the tune of $1.1 million that never came before us. I would want to have someone come before the council and say something. Right. But nobody has done it. Could it, let's see now, the, who appoints the attorney general? The governor and council. Yeah. So there's something very, this, it's mysterious. To there's say the some least. fishy stuff going on with that. that that AG, I actually had legislation in, a few years ago to have his position become an elected one, because all he does is a, basically kind of a rubber stamp for the governor. There's no now. Who is it? The AG? Who is Foster it? is Foster. now. Foster, I okay. think. Because yeah. I have not seen any real oversight. I know when they on FRM. Um, that's uh, for those people don't remember. That was a bunch of people had uh, took their money and invested it. The banking commissioner and some other people um, were connected to it, and it was a big investment thing up near the lakes. Right. And the guy basically had property that he would show you that you're investing in, but he didn't really, right. wasn't really <laughs> doing anything. And so a lot of people lost their shirt. And when it went 
I was sitting there at one of these hearings in the, in the legislature, and the attorney general's office actually had the gall to get up this little weasel, cotton picking age assistant attorney general or whatever his name was, got up there and said, um, the attorney general because they had gotten complaints. Mm-hmm did exactly what they were supposed to do. We turned it over to the uh, banking commissioner. That's what we're supposed to do with that information because that's where that information goes. Then they turned around within a very short period of time and said, if we had more money, we could do more. That's a very, very... I hear that song all the and time it, from up yeah, there. Yeah, but think about the contradiction. Exactly. Either, either A, they didn't do all... They couldn't do all they wanted to do because they didn't have the money to do it. Okay? That mm-hmm. would be logical. Right. Or they had plenty of money and they just didn't do it because it wasn't their responsibility. But the the two the two things are... are, are he's like, like a lot of attorneys speaking out both sides of his mouth. It's you know, and I think that's the the reason I just uh, I have decided to run for this because I I understand the importance of the executive council because they make huge impact. They have their decisions have huge impacts on the state. The appointment of judges. The mm-hmm. uh, you know, if someone says, well, what, would you have a litmus test? And I said, absolutely not. But I would interview these folks, mm-hmm. and if they feel that the constitution is a uh, soft putty like thing that can be changed and interpreted. They're not going to get my vote because our forefathers were, they were so, they're such visionaries. That constitution should be, it's, in my opinion, it's, it's granted and it does, it's not to be chipped away and taken away. And when you hear uh, one of the, one of the big arguments is Second Amendment. I am the, in fact, in this race, I'm the only uh, member of the NRA. Okay. And I believe firmly in that. And I believed enough in the constitution of the United States that when I was 18 years old, I joined the Navy. And I am a Vietnam veteran, and uh, I realized as a young boy just how much and how precious this freedom is and how many people have given all so we could have that. And for someone to say, well, you don't need to have a weapon. You don't need your Second Amendment rights. Well, I disagree completely mm-hmm. because especially in the world we live in today with terrorists walking into these places, and it doesn't. And this, this present administration is just... It's mind-boggling when they have a terrorist shoot a bunch of people. It's another gun issue. Right. Please, yeah. you've uh, they're, they're so out of touch with reality. And that though is part of the progressive liberal agenda. Everything for everybody, with mm-hmm. absolutely no concept as how to pay for it. And I'm kind of on the other side. I'm the former, uh, for four years, I was the chairman of the Granite State Taxpayers. And I believe... Okay, yeah. I think that's where I first met yeah, you, right? Exactly. Okay. And that's, I believe firmly in this, that there are people in our society that are very vulnerable and we must take care of them. Mm-hmm. I believe in that. Yeah. That's what we do. We've, right. we've done that since time immemorial. But I also understand that government cannot grow faster than the people's ability to pay for it. Right. And when you have a group of... Uh, uh, the progressive wow. liberal movement right. that is trying to give everything to everybody with no concept how to pay for it. Right. And they say they take the pledge, well, I'm against the tax. Well, if you keep spending $200 million a day, right. there's going to have to be one. Right. So, exactly. I mean, let, yeah. let their actions should be there. I, I, yeah. pu- I, um, I don't want to get too far right. afield, but I was, I was uh, really upset, I think yesterday or Monday, I saw a post where the, the Ford Foundation is funding Black Lives Matter. Okay? Now, I know this has nothing to do with your seat, but I get a, I get a vent. So I thought about that, and I tried to think, because the Ford Foundation is liberal. That's mm-hmm. what they do. They right. promote liberal ideas. But I'm trying to think of what, and, and we've, talked, we've talked about a basic principle on the show that if you have an issue, let's say the border, all right, the reason the border has never been resolved, regardless of what people say when they try to get elected, is because there's no money in solving it. Exactly. Okay? Right. right. If they fix the border, Republicans would stop getting money to fix the border, and Democrats would stop getting more to, to uh, keep open borders. Right. 
Yeah. So there's money going on both sides, and as long as that there's that conflict, they have money coming in. Right. That's why we argue about the same issues as when I was a kid. Exactly. Yeah, nothing. So ever nothing changed. Nothing changes. Right. But now, if you fund Black Lives Matter, okay, same type of thing. If you spend money to when you're endorsing Black Lives Matter, you're financing Black Lives Matter. They will have no motivation to stop the conflict. Exactly. So you are deliberately creating conflict in the inner cities of this country by financing one of the entities that is the most vocal and most violent the way they're trying to deal with. There are real issues. Don't, don't get me wrong. Exactly. But it's, it's insane. It's, it, uh, to me, and, you know, when, when I saw that, I, I posted next to it RICO. Because to me, that's the, uh, the RICO Act was when, when uh, um, any group basically uh, deliberately tries to corrupt the United States yeah. via be it violence or whatever it right. is. Racketeering. Racketeering. Right. racketeering. Exactly. To me, it's racketeering. Well, you know, the bottom line is, is that I've, whenever I get questioned about that, I said all lives matter. matter. And we, I had nothing to do with any of the issues, you know, 200 years ago to, to you know, they, they say they've been put upon. But let's look at, uh, once again, at our progressive liberal agenda. They keep them in poverty. They Deliberately. Make it, exactly. And so let's look at who's really the problem. And the Republicans take it on the chin all the time. Last time I looked, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican. Yes. And he freed those people. And, and it was just such a shame what had happened to them, and I feel for them. I, I had the privilege and honor of serving in the Navy with a, a great number of black individuals. If they're fine folks, and a lot of those guys that I served with, I'm sure, are just as upset as we are that they agree all lives matter. But right. we've, we've just got a culture now that, that wants to split us and put us into t camps, and that's unnecessary. My one comment about that, though, is the two things to me are not mutually exclusive. I, I think this Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter argument is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's, you, you can say both. Exactly. You know, you, yes, All Lives Matter, <laughs> but when, when they say Black Lives Matter, and I understand there's people running that sort of organization who don't have the necessarily the best of intentions, but there's also a lot of people who participate in the movement innocently who do have good intentions right. and when they say black lives matter they're not saying black lives matter and that means nobody else lives matter it's all about us right and i think that's how a lot of people take it but they're just saying hey look guys we have a little bit of a special problem here you know i mean us as three none of us are ever going to get pulled over and be worried that we might get right. shot that if, is you know, not true that it's is, unlikely it is not true there's actually a greater likelihood that you'll be shot if you're white how? Cops. Uh, Percentage wise. Um, cops yes, shoot more white people? Yes, they do. The other thing, too, is I was a teenager and I did not necessarily hang around with the most. Um, like when you were going over to doing the right thing, I was not. And I will tell you absolutely that if there is a crime in an area, okay, I don't care what area it is white black hispanic whatever it is okay if there is a crime done in an area they're going to look for whoever the teenagers are that are up running around mm -hmm. and they're going to question them now if that's in a black community that's who they're going to question okay like this latest uh, the the uh, the one where this all started where his hands up don't shoot mm -hmm. the guy had already done a strong arm robbery had walked through, cops got a complaint, they saw two teenagers, one was probably, uh, maybe they got a description he was big, and he was a big kid, and he stopped to talk to him. That's what the cops are supposed to do. And if, I know, I'll, I'll give you an example, and this, it was crazier back in the 60s and 70s. This is uh, early 70s, my, uh, Two of my buddies and two friends they knew from Marlboro went and uh, broke in at after hours and stole a couple of cases of beer out of a package store. Okay? My buddies and his VW Bug. Dumb, he used to have on the side of his Bug, it said white punks on dope. 
this is this is the <laughs> not the smartest thing to right. do if you don't want to get strip searched. Anyway, <laughs> so they're taken off. Okay, they've stolen a couple cases of beer. They go down the road. The cops have the road blocked off. It turns out that the the guy who owned the package store like lived right next door and called the cops. So they see him go in a direction. They get the road blocked off. Well, it's a VW Bug, which are as close to four-wheel drive as you get without actually having a four-wheel drive. So he drives around. You know what the cops did? They shot four holes through the back of that VW Bug, grazed one of the kids on the inside. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's insane. Yeah. Okay, oh. you're about to, to snuff out a 17-year-old kid's life over two cases of beer. Yeah. So I'm just saying, I was on that side of the fence. I know how it works. If you're a teenager and you're causing trouble, the cops are going to question you. And it has well, nothing to do with color. It has to do with the fact it's an age discrimination, if you want to call it that. Well, I, yeah, but in, in, in logical, me, right? Another way to look at it. In me, right. I'm not saying cops don't mess with white people in ridiculous ways. Of course they do. I'm just saying I find it hard to believe that uh, that white people are more likely to be shot at a traffic stop, like that guy who got his arm literally shot off. Right. And where was that? In Atlanta. Well, I'm not saying that bad right. things don't ha happen and cops don't make stupid decisions right. or they get too arrogant. Right. I mean, I've had cops like scream at me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The stupid stuff that they, they shouldn't even be upset about. But I do think blacks have a unique problem. I'm, I'm in major cities. Okay. Not well, not around here, but we're a white state. I, but, <laughs> but you know, I, I think one of the issues right now is that uh, nationwide now the police have have a target on them. And who do we call to protect our families? Right. Well, right now, I'm not I'm not at home, and my wife, if there's anybody bothering her or the family, she calls the police, and that that's what we've got to remember that one or two. Bad apples don't spoil the whole. Oh, absolutely, push. I agree. And I think that, uh, and especially here in Manchester, it's been quite dangerous. Yeah, a lot of officers shot at. Uh, oh yeah. I mean, it's been very. So yeah. it's 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 getting a little bit out of hand, and and I think it all circles right back to the opioid crisis. Uh, these people who are fighting for turf, could it be that they maybe are dealing in these drugs and stuff? And right. the, of course. And, and so that's where, you know, we got to really... That's why there's more violence after a major drug bust. Exactly. Because now you got a whole new set of drug dealers it's, shooting each other in the street. Right, and, and we need to really get a hold of this thing. And, and it's, it's going to be, it's got to be a partnership between government and non-government entities to stop this thing. Yeah. We've got to cure them, get them off this stuff. But as we all know, they've got to want to right. get off it. But it, and, and it leads to being, uh, robberies, burglaries, and everything else, so they can get the money for this stuff. And and we, we just need to we need to have a, a joint effort between our, our law enforcement and our clinicians that can help get these people off that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that. Uh, speaking of uh, executive council, I know that. Uh, no, I shouldn't say I know that. I don't know. <laughs> I have heard that. Um, uh, speaking of executive council, that hope for recovery is having a wicked tough time getting money. That's oh. I, I can't understand. I don't know that. why. What what wow, what happened I didn't there? Know that. The, oh, yeah. the, the, the money was approved. They had a special session, and it's it's not there yet. Why? Oh. Yeah, if I were a counselor, troubling. I would be standing yeah. on that right now. Why isn't this taken care of? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it is it is true, and I, and and huh. and uh, I I know the people at Hope for Recovery, and they do great work. Yes. They are part of the reason why we've actually seen a decline in the number of people dying on the streets of Manchester, yet for some reason... Is that Chris, Chris Blevins, or is she... No, Chris is part of... Uh, it's hard to keep Amber's, them all straight. Yeah. Right. My friend Chris Blevins does Amber's Place. Oh, mm -hmm. right, It right. was her, her uh, uh, stepdaughter and, you know, Mark's daughter that uh, passed away a few years ago, mm -hmm. Amber, and um, Melissa Cruz and Holly who has a last name that I'll probably never be able to pronounce. <laughs> I can't remember, yeah. I remember her vividly. She's, yeah. she's got a big personality. Yeah, she's got a great personality. <laughs> and, and they're over at Hope for Recovery, and they're just... And, uh, and like, Melissa Cruz has got to be one of the nicest people on the planet. Exactly. And, and they, I can't, can't, they can't get help to... They just got a check from somebody, but it wasn't from the government. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We've got to find out... Uh, see, that's what, that's what a counselor does. And I think this is very important important that if I were elected counselor, if I'm fortunate enough to get the, the election, 
I will represent 250,000 constituents in District 4 and everybody in the state of New Hampshire. I will not represent special interests. And that's what's going on right now. You've got yeah. people who are focused today. Now, this is a real shock to a lot of people. Today, Planned Parenthood of Northern New England endorsed Colin Van Ostern's run for governor. I can't figure that out. I don't out. even know who that what is. A shock. Colin Van He's he what is an he's an executive counselor oh, okay. who just voted to bring back. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And now and he's running for with, governor with yeah. Chris Sununa. and and they're giving him an endorsement. I mean, yeah, yeah. And I wonder how that all happens. Please. Well, the thing is, it's so the, transparent. Yeah. Well, actually, Van o o Oyster, Oyster, Van Oster. Yeah, whatever. So <laughs> he doesn't bother me as much as Sununu. I'll tell you why. I was there last year when the, uh, earlier this year, or was it last year, that when the executive council voted against finance, uh, um, supporting Planned Parenthood. Last July. Last July, okay. So I was there when they voted. I was sitting there and um, um, the Maggie Hassan and Van Oyster, or whatever his name is, and those guys all made their quick speeches about and the need for help Pappas. for young girls and right. Pappas, uh, Chris Pappas. They all made their speeches about, you know, well, we got to help young people and we need we need uh, abortion clinics. And Sunu and Maggie Hass had parroted what they're all saying in the news media. This was right after they had done that expose mm -hmm. on with uh, interviews with people at Planned Parenthood where they talked about dissecting children specifically to get specific organs out right if you're careful enough how you do it and they're eating dinner while this woman's explaining how you do it okay and i saw the entire video but what the news media did is because what this is what the news media does is they try to downplay it by saying well those are highly edited videos well that's absolutely true because everything you see on TV is highly edited. Exactly. Because if you're going to get a speech from Obama, they're not going to give you the whole speech. They'll give you snippets. It's highly edited because you're not going to want to sit there for two hours. Right. All right? So they edited those down to about six minutes, I think. And you can still, I think they're still on YouTube. Um, so they were highly edited. But they weren't edited to change the intent of the conversation. Right. They were edited to uh, eliminate the bathroom breaks or when they were talking about the food they were getting and all the other crap that is totally irrelevant to the right. subject. And so anyway, so Maggie Hassan says, well, those were highly edited, which I knew was an absolute lie because she's implying that they were highly edited and distorted via editing that is not true it never was true she's a liar okay so Nunu sat back and said and responded and i could tell the guy was stressed i was i was sitting there you know you know an arm arm's length away about watching his face he was stressed out but he said uh you know i watched the entire video and they and what you see is, you know, and so there's, no, you know, in effect, I can't vote for this. And that I had respect for him because I knew he was kind of pro-life, pro-choice mm -hmm. on, on the fence. And I get that. Matt's that way. So I yeah. get that argument. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't agree with it, obviously, but I get it. Well, so, you know, just to interject, when a lot of people ask me about my stance on that, my wife and I have six children, ten grandchildren. But going back to Vietnam, when I was 18 years old, I was a corpsman. I dealt in the human wreckage of war. Yeah. And when you see hump someone hanging on to their life with every fiber in their being, at, an, at the age of 18 years old, I never heard of pro-choice, pro-life. I'd never heard of that sure. back in 1969. Sure. But I realized at that moment that life was the most precious gift we get, have mm -hmm. and that I feel that one should never be taken as a matter of convenience. Right. And I stay by that till the day I die. See, for me, I have kind of a unique position. I, you've heard me say this. I'm, I consider myself pro-choice, but I actually think defunding Planned Parenthood is probably a good idea because I think everyone would be better off 
including Planned Parenthood in the long run, because if you if you get the government out of it, mm -hmm. it to some extent, not entirely, but to right. some extent depoliticizes it. And then your tax dollars aren't going to that. And right. why do they need all that extra money anyway if all they're doing is buying politicians to make sure they exactly. stay funded? So just get rid of that merry-go-round of money. Right. right. And, yeah. I agree 100%. And the, the bottom line is, is that we just put 50,000 people on expanded Medicaid. Mm -hmm. What does Planned Parenthood offer that they don't? They say these, these young ladies were not getting their, their, their checkups and their, their needs met medically. Well, by expanding it, they are. So, you know, the uh, that's an interesting point. So, yeah. what is it? There's only one thing that's. Right. And, right. and that's, that should not, as you're, you're spot on, should not be used, tax payers' dollars, should not be used to fund abortions. Yeah. So, so, so then we come back to this July yeah. when um, they voted on it again, and Chris Sununu sat there, and, and Nick, uh, uh, Chris Pappas, Pappas didn't even hesitate, voted to <laughs> fund uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, Sununu voted to fund Planned Parenthood, and that was the that was a majority vote they needed, and it was it was astounding to me because the other the Democrats at least you could pres hope you presume that they're willfully ignorant, they're deliberately buying into the lie that it was highly edited. He saw the entire video. He knows exactly what Planned Parenthood is doing, and yet he has lacks the moral fiber to vote against it again. I, I that blew me away, I, and I, I talked to him at the the taxpayer picnic about it because it, it. I'm sorry. Anyway, but that's one issue. <laughs> yes, it is. But I have no strong opinion either way. <laughs> I could tell. I could yeah. tell. You're very dispassionate about I it. I know. Yes. I know. <laughs> Well, you know, the exec once again, the executive council is, is the, in my, it, it's the pivot point. Everything has to go through there. And you have to have people there that will represent their constituents, not special interest. And that is, that is imperative, in my opinion, for good government, governance. You've got to have that. And, and right now, that's not the case. No. No, there's a lot of stuff that the executive council does that it's not it's not really oversight as much as it seems as if it's rubber stamping stuff. Right, and I, I you know someone asked me the other day about the railroad, and first question I asked them, I said, now I have been around for a long, long time, and if that were a money maker, company X Y Z would already have the tracks laid and be running that. It is not. It's a it's just a, a money sink. Exactly. You, for $300 million, we put that line in. It's going to cost New Hampshire anywhere from 7 to $10 million a year to maintain. And the people, the taxpayers to maintain that. And the people up in Littleton, they're going to pay the same as a guy that gets to go every day to, down to, to Massachusetts. And I, my feeling on that is let's lighten up the business tax. Let's make this a more business-friendly place for big companies to come with these very good high paying jobs we won't need a train because our our citizens can just go across the you know that get down street, into yeah. nashua or manchester and go to a wonderful job because we've got the smart people that and and our our young people as they graduate from college they're voting with their feet they're leaving because they can't find the jobs because yeah. we are so non-business friendly yeah. now the legislature and the senate did a Good thing by finally reducing some of that tax, we've got to do more of that, and we also need to get after the energy issues. Yes. When you look at our energy costs, they are terrible. They're and, and they're talking about this uh, Northern Pass. Well, my question is, how much of that power are they going to guarantee us? They're not. That's exactly. That, that's, that's, you know, it's like uh, I was t I've said on the show, I had a friend who had a, a, a house up... Um, and I forget what, near Twin, uh, before Twin Mountains, I forget what it is. Lincoln? Is no, where's the trading post? The something uh, bear with a big go see oh, the bear. Oh, Clark's trading post. Uh, that's yeah. in, uh, let's see. Whatever is, town that is. It's uh, not in Conway. I think it's well, Glendale, it, maybe? Anyway, but it, that, that area. He's got, a, he's got a house right down the street. So he, he, he used to come in when I was working uh, in the machine shop. He'd come in. Oh, you can't let that Northern Pass, you know, blah, 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 blah. But he would he'd be very mad about yeah. Northern Pass. Well, then he saw a map of where Northern Pass actually was intended to go, and he found out that it was like four miles from his house. Didn't care anymore. 
did not care at all if you built it or not built right. it. Right. Which right. showed me a lot of what's going on. I mean, because a lot of people are so profoundly selfish. <laughs> it's it's it mind-boggling to mm -hmm. me that they can be uh, that selfish. But anyway, we went up to... Uh, that was when Bill O'Brien was, was in. We A bunch of us went up mm -hmm. and, and talked to the people at um, uh, Hydro-Quebec and stuff. And th this whole argument is fine because everybody, he's got his cell phone. I get this tablet. Everybody wants electricity. There's lights, you know, the, the microphones. Everything here runs on electricity, okay? Everybody wants electricity. Everybody wants to run their AC and everything else. But nobody wants any uh, sources of generating the electricity, <laughs> which is basically narrow-minded and ridiculous. Right, exactly. And the reason, but the thing that I have been, not because of Northern Pass, but the reason I've been against it is because New Hampshire gets very little for its money. The power goes all the way down and enters into the, the grid and our rates don't go down. Exactly. And it's in Connecticut. It's in Connecticut. And it's destroying our second most lucrative business, which is our tourism. Right. Everybody's going to want to come and see these 150-foot steel monsters walking through the beautiful <laughs> mountains. I mean, there's just, it makes no sense. We have to, renewable energy is the key to longevity for my grandchildren and, and yes. everybody's grandchildren. I understand that. But we need to make certain that we get some of that power. Because I was told the other day by someone who's uh, quite knowledgeable about it, is that the uh, when they when they built uh, Seabrook, yep, that power doesn't go, come to New Hampshire. No, nope. right. So we get the the let's how do we put it? We re, we get the potential of a disaster, and we get nothing for it. Yeah, I mean, I think we get to build for it. Exactly. <laughs> yes, we certainly. Do. And how about the scrubbers in Bow? The $400 million scrubbers they put in the Bow Power Plant, which is just down the road. Yeah, I don't know to, about this. Well, to, uh, to uh, scrub the coal, because it's a coal burner. Yeah. To scrub. And now they're, they're saying, well, we're not going to use coal anymore. We're going to use natural gas, so we don't need the scrubbers. We can do it a lot cheaper. So they're evidently going to sell that. And the PUC is giving them, uh, they give the shareholders and the uh, Eversource, they say, okay, well, we've got to make sure that they don't get hurt. Well, who's taking care of the ratepayer? That's right, what right, I want right. to know. And I would be asking those questions if I were in the executive council. I'd say, well, wait a minute. We've got elderly folks between their property taxes and their electric bill. They can't stay here anymore. Mm -hmm. What What are we doing about that? Right, right. No, it's it's true. I mean, and then when you we built the uh, the Seabrook, that was supposed to be two plants. Oh, or yes. Two, two uh, generators. Two generators. But lawsuits and everything else. Every again, we had the uh, the group of people that want all kinds of electricity, but don't want any sources to generate mm -hmm. it. It's just it's 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 a it's insane. We're we're shooting ourselves in the foot on a regular basis. Exactly. My wife and I have a prop piece of property in Alton. Someday we're going to build our retirement home there. Yeah. And we buried our power for five thousand two hundred eighty-two feet. It's not cheap. It's, it's costly. Yeah. But yeah. we still have the beautiful, pristine views. Mm -hmm. And I say, if they want to, they want to do this. It, let's bury it. Right. Probably almost all the way down. And in certain areas where we have right of ways of these big giant monsters, anyway, yeah. then that's that's okay. Sure. They've been there for 50 years. Right. Use that. Right. But we need to we need to protect the beauty of this great state of ours. And by the way, how about 30 to 35 percent of that power? We'll just take a left turn right into New Hampshire, yeah. and let's maybe lower the rates a little bit. Uh, here's an interesting what you might might not know is so we, we uh, the bunch of us go up there to uh, talk to the guy at Hydro Quebec and it was my buddy Al Baldessaro was there and a bunch of other radicals which I, I love it I, I'm <laughs> sorry I know people out there are all upset about Al Baldessaro but I think he's awesome so anyway we're, a bunch of us are up there we sit down be, uh, in front of the salesman for Hydro Quebec, you know, fancy suit, five thousand dollar suit or something. That's what Bill O'Brien told me. I have no idea what <laughs> suits cost. Now how does Bill know that it's five? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he must wear them. He, yeah, he, 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 I'm sure he actually does know. Yes, I'm you know, sure I got he does. my first suit in the legislature at uh, Goodwill because <laughs> that's the way to do it. <laughs> 
As long as it fits, that's yeah, all that counts. Fits, yeah. I don't care. So anyway, um, I'm asking him because remember back in the '80s, there were there was all this conversation about uh, power lines and people getting cancer near power lines. Right. Okay. Well, I was never in a position to ask anybody, but at that point in my life, I was. I asked him. I said, I have always believed or thought it's quite likely that the relationship between cancer and power line had everything to do with defoliants to control the underbrush. Because you were in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. What happened to those guys? Exactly. Okay, so that to me was probably, a, there was a correlation. So I asked him about using defoliants, what they were going to do to control the underbrush if they did have the uh, uh, northern pass. And he said the interesting, is in, is very interesting response. He said, we're not allowed in Canada to use defoliants. That was his answer. So his answer wasn't that they would not. It was that they're not allowed to in Canada. No so, problem down here. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, I, so there's a, yeah, if you're, if you're executive council, you have a lot these are the things that we we need to address we need to make certain exactly that, because we're you know our job is, is the, or i should say the council's job is multifaceted but that's why we have never seen and to this point anyway a governor walked out of the office with handcuffs mm -hmm. like it happens in chicago i mean in illinois and other places oh yeah they've had what three of them i think so yeah, they're, decades, they're, they're, yeah. They're, see that this <laughs> is the checks and balances because you've got to have three people that will go with you on this and and that's that's pretty it's pretty elaborate and it's and it's also a wonderful check and balance system it and is. it keeps keeps that from happening but it also we need to it now it's starting to get as i mentioned earlier that the special interests you hit the nail on the head when you look at planned parenthood's filing 20 million dollars on hand mm -hmm. 1 million dollars for lobbyists 200,000 dollars for campaign contributions right what are they doing with those you have to right, just yeah. get that out of there exactly right yeah. right now how much do they actually get from the state it was five hundred and sixty two thousand dollars if i remember correctly but what made everybody so if they're getting five hundred and sixty two thousand and they're spending 1.2 million dollars to get it why, yeah, what's why wrong are with they that? doing that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what's wrong with that? But the the thing that the piece of this that really I found, and I spent my time, I went to every former executive counselor I could find. I, I went to Earl Rinker, yeah. and Ray Wazorek, and Tom Colantuna. How's all Ray of the, doing? Ray's doing what? Fine. Yeah. And all I went to all of these folks, and I said, did in, during the time you were a counselor, did a, a contract that was defeated during that two year biennium? Mm -hmm. Did it ever come back in the same year? They said never. If they wanted to bring it back, they brought it back in the next budget call. So this one was done. But hmm. this is where it really, in my, it went sideways in my opinion, is that during that June meeting, David Wheeler asked the $50,000 question. He said now to the commissioner, he said, you said that when they were not funded last July, that they continued to do what they did? He says, yeah, they were able to cobble together some money to do that. Okay, so they, they were not funded. They continued to do their operation. This revote in this June, this so one year later, they revote, and they pay them retroactive to when they get, when their contract was not voted in. Now that is really I, I, unethical. I, I I'd say that is mm -hmm. that stinks. That, that's unethical. That's that is pretty unethical. You would think that it would be it that would cut off exactly. Yeah, because I remember I remember hearing that argument, and I didn't quite it didn't quite sink in because I'm Irish, you know. <laughs> but but to do that, I mean, once again, I would I would have no and and I would have because I am pro life and I believe that that uh, women's health is one of our most important issues, but I don't believe that the taxpayers' money should fund abortions. And I would have voted against that and we wouldn't be having this discussion. But, right. But it's, it's the, the people have got to understand that if they want to have someone that'll take care of, have their back covered, 
Right. And I, I, you know, I believe in such simple stuff. And I was a little kid. I'm 12 years old. I had my baseball bat and glove on my shoulder. My dad said, you go put that stuff away. He says, you're going to learn the value of a dollar. So one of his old army buddies took me over to the Floral Park Cemetery, gave me a pair of clippers, and I clipped around the hedge. <laughs> this was eons before that wonderful thing called the weed whacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you did it all by hand. Yeah. And there were 5,218 stones. And I'd start at the back, work to the, get, I'd get up there three days later, half dead, boiling in the sun. Wow. And the sun really reflects off those things. Oh, yeah. So I'm... Tongue hanging out, drinking about a gallon of water an hour, and he says, get back there where you start again. I did that all summer, a dollar an hour, but I learned the value of a dollar, how hard they are to come by, and how the fact that people who are working hard every day, it would be wonderful if they could keep some of that. Right. So I, I would promise to anybody who votes for me that for every tax dollar the state spends, they will get a dollar's worth of value. Mm -hmm. It won't right. be... Let's just kind of throw it up and see where it goes. Yeah, right. we, we do a lot of that. I think uh, one of the things we did uh, under the Democrats was turn over control of fish and game budget basically to the fish and game so they can tax, not tax, but change fees whenever they, they and the, their uh, commissioners say it's okay. Wow. And the fees have gone up ridiculous. You know? That's so a lot of autonom autonomy to give them. It is. It is <laughs> stupid wow it was stupid it used to be that if you want if they wanted to raise the fee for bear license or whatever license it would have to go before the legislature so people could come up and and yell about it and and kick and and stuff like that but not anymore i mean the, the exact the uh fishing game commission does have meetings right but i don't think most people know where they are you'd have to be pretty informed to even find out where right. they are mm. But you know, but that goes back to the, what we mentioned earlier: tourism, and the uh, the beautiful lakes and streams we've got, and and fishing and hunting, and all, those are all the things that make this state so special. And we need to stop making it more and more difficult for people to do these things. Right. More and more expensive. Exactly. I mean, you know, eventually, you know, you're you're, uh, you're just you're just gonna, you know, if you keep nickel and diamond people to death, they're just not gonna come up here. You know what I mean? They'll find some place exactly. else to go that's cheaper. You know, we've we've got a, there's there's so many things before the council that need to be given a great deal of thought. And I feel sometimes as I watch the meetings, and then you can of course you can get on uh, the uh, public networks and watch the entire meeting because they film every one of them. Right. And it and it's 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 rather interesting to see how how your money is being spent. Yeah. It is really funny too. They have executive council meetings. They have so much uh, pomp and circumstance before they get started. Will the is, singers is come in? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They have yeah. some singers come in and really, yeah, yeah. no That's kidding. Cool. Oh yeah. The day of the second vote on Planned Parenthood, that place was packed. There had to be, uh, you know, and once again, huh. rules are for everyone, not just for the working man and woman. That that chamber those chambers were they had to be way over the building's requirements they had to be because yeah. there were there were a large number of uh, pro-life people a large number of pro-choice people and they all came into the i mean they, we were yeah. packed in there like sardines <laughs> oh, yeah. but it was okay now yeah, if okay. some if the fire marshal come in and said governor 60% of these people are going to leave. Let's go. Yeah. That wouldn't happen. But, you know, we need to, what I, I firmly believe is that doing the right thing means you just don't say it. You do it in everything you do. Right. You just stay consistent. Exactly. So that you're not getting special rules for, for different people. Right. Can, oh, by the way, thank you for your service. Thank you. And this is completely off topic, but I, I never quite understood why people in the Navy were actually in Vietnam. My, I always th thought of it as like an Army, Marine type. My dad, w my dad was in the Navy and in Vietnam as well. Well, yeah. the, the, the Navy um, it was twofold. They, well, really three. The aircraft carriers gave ready air support. Right, I got they that were, They were gone quickly. And the destroyers, with their five-inch guns, were able to get close to the shore and give ground support to the Marines and the Army. And in the 
the, because the Marines are part of the United States Navy, they do not have corpsmen. None of their medical staff. So all doctors and corpsmen are Navy people, and they are the ones that, re, that are responsible for caring for the Marines in uh, combat. Them. Is that what you were? Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, now it makes sense. Because now it's even if it's even completely different. Because we've had uh, um, Lynn Blankenbecker, who's uh, she's, she's in D- she's in D.C. now, right? She's yeah. She's the one D.C. Who, yeah. She is a full what we call in the Navy. She's a four striper. She's a captain. Yeah. She is such a success story. She's a wonderful person, and she has seen more than most people could ever imagine. Yeah. One of the most horrible things she came on the show and talked about was that when she first, because she served in uh, Iraq, uh, Iraq 1 and 2, and then in Afghanistan. And she said she was in Afghanistan, and they, they would get these kids in come injured. Okay? And she would patch them up, and she kind of, you know, because they're little kids, so, you know, uh, you, get, you kind of feel compassion for them. Right. And then, what she found out was that Ira- the, the people in Afghanistan were taking their own children and pushing them in front of military vehicles because if the kid gets killed, the American government pays them. Right. And um, sometimes if they're too badly injured after they get out of the hospital, they just shoot them. The, it's, it's a different, you know, I tell everybody that when you have been in, when I was in Vietnam, it was just so sad to see what happened to the families. The, the villages would be overrun and, and the young ones, and, and it was just such a sad thing. And I was, it was really a very, very special day for me about, oh, in June. Uh, the Vietnamese community in Manchester had a wonderful fundraiser for MIAs, Missing in Action, mm and POWs that still could be in Vietnam. They raised money to try and have people look for these folks to see if indeed it is. And I was never, it was a, uh, an afternoon that, you know, it's, it wasn't a political grin and grab, go by and shake hands. I spent about three and a half hours there. And the most rewarding thing for me was to see these beautiful little children who wouldn't be alive today had we not got as many as we did. but. Shame on the United States, we didn't get as many out as we should have. Because these people were loyal to us, they helped us, and all hell was brought down on them when we left, and that was a shame. But to see these, how these folks have assimilated into the community, and they do such, uh, they're just hard, industrial, they work so hard for this, as we call it, the American way, which so many people take for granted. And what really, really, I think, is where we all get an education. As I sat next to this young, there were two young, they were third generation Vietnamese. Yeah. One was an engineer and the other was going to be a doctor. And he said, you, your people, of course he was talking about the Americans. Yeah. He said, have no idea of how lucky they are. He oh, said, yeah. you have the greatest country in the world. And he said, they don't know it. Right. No, most people don't. And it's just, and you know, that was such a profound statement. I said, by golly, you're right. And as he said, he said, they have more freedoms than any people in the world. But he so said, now, they've got to understand that with those freedoms come responsibilities. And they're throwing the responsibilities out the window mm-hmm. because, once again, of this progressive movement, everything for everybody. My dad and mom used to tell me you can have anything you want. If you, you roll up your sleeves it. and work yep, for it. it. And Jim, there are people now who, they don't have that same right. drive. Jim, we, we've got to go. It's thank you very much. I really hope you win because you are well, an awesome you. dude. Thank you. And if anybody would like to get any more info on me, jimadams.org. Tell us well, all about me. That's easy. That's there easy you go. Site. Great. Hey, uh, Thanks, Kim Morin's coming on next week. The famous Kim Morin's coming on, and that should be crazy. No, how do I know that? I, that I, that's very. She re- writes for Granite Rock and some oh, other yes, stuff. Oh yes, yes, yeah. okay. Yes. Anyway, uh, see you next week, guys. Bye, everybody.